the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, the airliner that went to war. Tactics and strategy, pros and cons of all kinds of reload. And Metal Beasts, a top-tier light cruiser from Britain. Today, we're looking at a light cruiser that crowns the British naval tree. Its creators wanted to give it enough firepower to be on a par with heavy cruisers while retaining low water displacement. That second demand was crucial. There were quite specific numbers concerning the mass of ships of this class in the London Navy Treaty. The result of their experiments and actions received the name of HMS Southampton. Its full load displacement is more than 11,000 tons. Maximum speed, 32 knots, or about 59 kilometers per hour. There are four main caliber turrets on each, containing three 152 millimeter cannons, two on the bow, and two on the stern. There are also four auxiliary caliber turrets with 102 millimeter guns, plus a couple of quad 40 millimeter two-pounders to protect you from enemy aviation. And don't forget about torpedoes. Each side of the ship has a three-tube launcher. The armor here is almost as thick as on heavy cruisers. 114 millimeters in the armor belt, 63 millimeters in traverse, 32 millimeters in deck, and from 25 to 51 millimeters in the main caliber turrets. Of course, when it comes to battle, the main caliber becomes your favorite toy. It has great fire rate and extremely deadly HE rounds that can sink any enemy you want. At the same time, your armor does the job protecting the engine compartment from retaliatory fire. Don't hesitate to take full ammo load. You'll quickly fire it all away, and your ammunition storages have enough armor to protect you from the unexpected detonations. Still, if something does go sideways, you'll almost always be able to hide from the enemy behind the nearest island or using a smoke screen. However, there is something you must be wary of. It's enemy torpedoes, of course. You'll definitely meet some opponents that have the long lance torpedoes. If you don't want to catch one of these, make a habit of looking around as often as you can and occasionally changing course. Another threat comes from enemy aviation. Though your auxiliary caliber is considered quite universal, it doesn't have any proximity or radio fuses. That means it won't be extremely effective against air targets. And you always risk letting an enemy plane closer than it's considered appropriate in polite company. Overall, this is a very balanced ship, quite handy with decent maneuverability and heavy armament. The combination of great firepower and robust armor makes it one of the best cruisers in the game. Oh, how he longed for this plane. Kurt Tank drew sketches, drafts, his drawing board always contained some sort of design of this elegant, beautiful airliner of tomorrow. Alas, the Nazi command couldn't care less. They wanted new fighters and bombers for the future conquests of the Reich. They only came to their senses in 1936, when their intelligence data started showing the Americans and even the French, the bloody French with their bloody Versailles, creating some speedy four-engine, long-range aircraft. What now? The US will have their Douglas DC-4E and the Boeing C-72. France will have its MB-160. And what do we get? The Junkers 52 with corrugated skin? No, sir. We Germans are a proud nation. We have to have something similar, if not superior. Oh, wait a minute. Didn't Kurt Tank have a project like that? Yes, yes, he did. Build it now. We'll spare the details of the Focke 200 success, 
It already went airborne in 1937 and rendered the whole world speechless, broke some records and quickly found buyers and clients in and out of Germany. All of that is pretty well known. A more intriguing situation happened after World War II had already started. Germany suddenly realized it lacked sea patrol planes that would have enough range to intercept English convoys from the USA. The Kriegsmarine submarines couldn't do the job. They didn't see much from under the water surface, and the only aircraft with enough flight range was the Ural bomber project that had been, uh, yeah, <laughs> closed by the Führer himself. But some reason, he had decided that Germany wouldn't need this type of aircraft in the coming war. And then the military remembered the Condor. The repurposed airliner turned out to be quite good for the job, until it met any kind of resistance whatsoever. One of the most ridiculous losses of them all? A Condor was shot down by a Gladiator biplane. The English pilot fired a blast from four machine guns from a kilometer away, you know, to scare it off without any hope. But one rifle-caliber bullet turned out to be enough to hit the accumulator and break the whole four-engine machine. Most of the instruments, fuel and oil pumps, radio, even the ignition plug distributors, all of that died moments after the hit. The crew barely managed to land the machine on water and surrender themselves to English sailors. What's there to say? Kurt Tank never intended on building a military aircraft. He didn't even think of caring about protected fuel tanks, gun posts, armor and all that. And the order to make a bomb hatch in the fuselage, <laughs> well, that was just ridiculous. Cut the bottom of a four-engine airliner and install half doors in there? That would only make it crumble right on the airfield. In the end, the FW-200C received a long ventral gondola with two gun posts and a bomb storage. It was the only way to fulfill the demands of the army without breaking the plane itself. The rest of the Condor still remained as fragile a civil aircraft as could be. Meanwhile, the decks of the Allied ships started receiving more and more AA guns. Then they started accompanying the Atlantic convoys with escort aircraft carriers and American Wildcats aboard them. At that moment, the Condor's military career came to its end. The Germans tried to use it as a transport aircraft to deliver supplies to the 6th Army led by General Paulus that was surrounded under Stalingrad. These attempts were also unsuccessful as the Soviet pilots quickly found all the weak spots of these four-engine monsters. The plane got its chance again, but after the war. Several of the Condors were finished in the USSR and used for recon missions above the Northeast Passage. The polar bears seemed to be unarmed and didn't pose any threat, so why waste this beautiful machine, right? They needed to use it for civilian purposes, though, since it was initially created just for that. In a tank duel, it's extremely important who shoots first, especially if nobody around is named Han. In that case, he definitely shoots first, no matter how you try. Sorry. <laughs> but you know what's even more crucial? Who fires the second shot faster? Reload rate is one of the most important parameters of any metal beast. And of course, during the course of history, the engineers were trying their best to speed the process up. The simplest option is, naturally, the manual reload. The reload rate here depends on the construction of a given tank, a weapon's caliber, the bigger it is, the heavier the round is, and the crew qualification. In the game, the difference between basic and ace qualifications can be measured in several whole seconds, as it's not only about the skill of the loader, but also about the leadership guidance from the commander. The manual reload has a huge advantage when it comes to dealing with the first stage ammo stowage. When all the rounds from it are shot out, your reload will suffer, but only a little. The process is basically the same, 
the loader just has to switch to other ammo racks. The other reload types will drop their fire rate significantly after the first stage ammo stowage becomes empty. Also, with manual reload you've got yourself an additional crew member, which only helps you survive longer. If you've been shot, you're only left with a loader plus any other crew member. Your tank will still be fully operational. Moving on. Some of the tanks have their reloading systems mechanized, but not fully automated. A perfect example is the Soviet heavy tank IS-7. It's got a great electric loader with a couple of crew members to work it, which makes the 130mm gun reload in mere 10 seconds, which is just a tiny bit slower than the 105mm weapons of the Western MBTs. The mechanized ammo stowages allow the loaders to compete and sometimes become even faster than the autoloaders. For example, if you ace the M1A1 Abrams, you can decrease the reloading time to 6 seconds, whereas the T80U with an autoloader will always have a fixed 6.5 seconds. So what's cool about the completely automatic loaders? First of all, it doesn't rely on human factor. Basic or ace, it will always be the same. The Japanese Type 90 always reloads in 5 seconds, no matter what, even if you lose a member of your crew. Also, the autoloaders made it possible to make the tank crew smaller, which meant lesser dimensions and thicker armor. Look at the latest Soviet MBTs. They are extremely compact and still very well protected. But the human factor isn't always bad. For example, in French favorite drum autoloaders, the first stage ammo stowage is extremely small. You make several shots and, oh, it's already time to search for cover. As for the carousel autoloaders in the Soviet machines, they often reload slower than some of the latest Western MBTs with manual reload systems. Of course, the really perfect tech, like on the Type 90, will always be faster than human hands. But even today, this technology is extremely expensive. And not every major army can afford developing something like this. So, we come to the main question here. Which reload type is the best? Well, the one you're used to. Manual reload won't be much slower after you've disposed of your first stage rounds. The autoloader provides constant intervals between the shots, and mechanized variants can do very well if you've got some skilled crew members around. And now, let's move to answering your questions. The first message was sent by a player called Chris Spam. How were tanks carried to war? Well, let's not forget that a tank isn't quite immobile on its own. A tank convoy can cover hundreds of kilometers using just common roads. But if you don't like this option for some reason, then okay, they could be transported over railways using cargo platforms and, well, trains. There was also a naval option, and sometimes they even dropped them from planes with huge parachutes attached to them. Like in the A-Team movie, if you know what we mean. Then there is a question sent by Plamenta Nev. Why? Some bombs don't explode in the moment they touch the ground. First of all, don't forget that a bomb isn't just a bag full of cyclonite. It's a complicated mechanism where every detail has its own function. One of these details is a fuse. It determines the conditions under which the detonation should happen. For example, engineers often set a timed delay between hitting something and exploding. For example, that way a bomber flying very low won't damage itself with its own blast. In the game, you can set this delay right before the battle. This option is called Bomb Activation Time. A user called Sabino Maglikmort 5 asks, 
start the penetration depend on the type of ammunition or the cannon length? Both, and many more other factors as well. We thoroughly went through all these formulae in the Shooting Range 137 that aired on March the 3rd. Don't hesitate to take a peek. Chonir O writes, What is the thickest conventional armor part in the game? No composite or space armor. That would most likely be this upper glacy plate of the American T-95 tank destroyer. The engineers weren't greedy here and threw as much as 305 millimeters of cast homogeneous armor, plus added some slope angles, you know, just in case. It's one of the most hard to penetrate full metal details in the whole game. And the last message for today was written by John Rett Lorelis. I'll subscribe if you make video with a dive bomber destroying an aircraft on the air using bombs. Not rackets, but bombs. Well, we value our every subscriber. So, here, enjoy. That's the way to do it. Well, now we've done our part of the deal fair and square. Now, we wait for your subscriptions. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. So, come on, people. Subscribe to the channel like John Rhett Laurel Lee's here. Press that bell button. Now you gotta leave a like. And tell us what you think in the comments below. See y'all in a week.